Halifax and Ottawa, and with judges from two federal courts. Over the years, he's also acquired experience in event planning. And to top it off, Andre is a published author, a presenter at various events, and also an amateur piano composer. So I'm really excited to be here with you, Andre. And Nicholas has been working at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office since 2015, starting as a training officer in the patent branch. And in 2018, he became a business service design and development officer, directly supporting the 2018 national IP strategy launched by the federal government. And since he joined the CIPO, he has gained extensive knowledge of the IP ecosystem in Canada, created digital products and resources for the IP awareness and education program, as well as presented to a wide variety of audience on many IP related topics. He holds a bachelor degree in education as his professional endeavors have always been in training, learning, design and outreach. Um, it's very exciting to be here with both of you. Nicholas is now working as an intellectual property advisor for the Ontario region, where he will be able to work more closely with Canadian innovator, hopefully with you all someday, and small, medium-sized businesses to help them learn about IP and how strategically leverage their IP assets. Now, that is super fascinating biography. Um, and I want to share that um, I was just listening into the French presentation. It's super amazing to have you both here. Um, and um, everybody's excited to learn about IP. Um, so over to you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Well, thank you, Ashra. And uh, thank, thanks everyone for joining, those who were able to attend, and then for Brilliant Labs for inviting us. It's uh, We always like to, to share our stories, and Nikolai and I, like, that's what we, we love the most about our jobs. So, and then just uh, for those who might be interested, I am from New Brunswick originally. Uh, grew up around Bathurst area. I did pretty much all the the towns around, including Bathurst. I I also were, was in Edmonston uh, from the age of eighteen to twenty one. My dad's from Prince Edward Island. I worked in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I I've been across Atlantic Canada. So now being talking about uh, how to protect your ideas. Um, across Atlantic Canada is wonderful for me. Uh, so I, I get to 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 manage it, to 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 merge both uh, the the region and 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 my passions. So, what is intellectual property? Right? Like it, a lot of people, even adults, because uh, it's not we usually don't hear much about this in school, and that's why we're trying to give more presentations. Uh, in schools, in college, in university, and beyond, like for adults, because it, it does, it is very, um, it's everywhere, as, as we'll see. So IP, or intellectual property, it's usually, because property, you, you hear the word property. Uh, so usually a property can be a house, a building, a car, a smartphone, those are property, you can own it. Is it, is it your house or my house? Is it your car or my car? Is it my smartphone? So is it yours or mine? That's it. You, you own it. It's your property or my property. But the same as about your ideas, you can own essentially your ideas. So IP is trying to protect the creation of the human mind, we say. So your ideas. Uh, and you're turning your ideas into new products or you improve existing products, you make it better. Uh, your brands, uh, like the, we'll see like uh, Nike, Reebok, McDonald's, we have like, uh, many, many brands and or designs the way things look the, the, or, the, or, or it could be artistic. And we'll see a lot of examples uh, during the presentation. And today we're going to talk mostly about four different types of IP. Uh, like I, like I, I, I usually call them like, they're all part of the family, one big family. And if the family, they're all uh, the same family, instead of being called Galantz, like my name, or, or Smiths, or it, it, they're called intellectual property. And they're all cousins. So one of them is patent. We'll talk about that. Trademarks, copyright, and industrial design. There's also more than that, but those are the main ones.
and then we will go to Nicola. Yeah, Perfect. thanks for sharing. So hi, everybody. So I'm Nicola Desia. So I'm not from the Atlantic coast like Andre, but I have family in PI. So I and I spent about, uh, you know, half a dozen summers in the Shediac area on the beach. So I, I really enjoy any time I go to Atlantic Canada. So I'm really happy to be here and, and talk to you all. Um, so yes, yeah, so let's talk about patents. So that's the first type of IP, right? That we have to discuss today. So what is a patent? Well, first and foremost, a patent is just a document. It's a piece of paper that here in Canada, we will give you if you can demonstrate and disclose that you have an invention. So you've invented either a technological advancement to a device or a technical object onto which there are four, three criteria that I will mention briefly in order to obtain a patent. So once you have that piece of paper, which is basically a legal document, it's a right, what it gives you, it actually allows you to exclude others from using that very same invention that you spend so much hard time and money and, and you know, effort to create without your permission. So even in school, very easily, a quick analogy that if someone is copying you in class, you're doing something even during an exam and you see someone is, is trying to look at what you're writing, what you're doing. They're basically trying to copy you and that's not fun, right? You don't want to do that yourself and you don't want others to do that to you. So it's kind of the same principle. So a patent will give you that legal right to say, hey, stop doing that. This is my invention. You can't produce it, manufacture it, sell it and make money. This is my invention. I have the right to pursue that and I'm, I'm kind of stopping you from doing that. So in order to get an, a patent for your invention, there are three criteria and you see them on the screen. The first one is new, has to be novel. It cannot currently exist anywhere in the world, right? So even if you're in whichever uh, region, province in the Atlantic coast, if it does exist in South Korea, in Japan, in Germany, uh, the examiners here can find it and they will say, well, sorry, buddy, your invention, it does currently exist in another country. So it's not new. You have to find a way to make something that doesn't exist right now anywhere in the world and there are ways to do that you can search databases which is i won't talk about that today but there are ways you can search and find if it's currently if it's novel or not the second criteria is that it has to work it has to work according to the laws of physics the laws of chemistry uh, biochemistry what any sorts of uh, of, of physics um, laws and natural laws that we have here on, on earth um, so if i'm to invent a, tr a time travel machine well, that would be pretty cool to have travel through time, go back in you know mid uh, middle ages or go to the future. But there's no way of that to, of working. There's no way using the laws of physics, using the natural laws that we know, uh, it cannot function. It cannot work. So you would not be able to get a patent to that invention, even though it would be really cool to have. The third one and the last one, it has to be inventive. So you have to find a way to make your invention clever enough or inventive or ingenious enough so that it's it's we've never thought of improving something or inventing something in the way that you are proposing so a quick example if i'm to change the color of something well that's pretty obvious that's not very inventive just changing the color you have to find a way to make your device your object your machine your process very clever very inventive so that no one saw that coming and that it's it's it you could get a patent for that because it's so clever it's so ingenious it's so inventive so these are the three criteria new has to work has to be inventive and for now what we tell everybody even the business owners the adults we always tell them keep it a secret for now if you're not sure what you want to do with your invention keep it a secret because if you start talking about it to other people this can backfire they can copy you they can run away and they can get a patent before you and once someone else has the patent, you can no longer try and get it back. It's, it's, it's gone. You'll have to develop a new invention. So keep it a secret for now. And that's kind of the golden rule uh, for, uh, for any invention until you know how to protect it. Well, I have a question, uh, Nicola. Like, uh, is, is patent only like if you invent something like a, 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 rock, like a, a rocket ship to go to the moon? Is, is it only like for like, like big inventions like, a, like a, um, yeah that's a, it's a good question so it doesn't have to be uh something out of a science fiction movie it can be something as um as 
even trivial as very day-to-day -day, uh, devices, appliances that you have around you. So if we, if we take the example of headphones, pretty much everybody owns a pair of headphones, either at work, at school, or at home. Yeah. So, but headphones have evolved over time. They used to be much bigger. They used to have uh, wires, uh, no mic was on. There was no artificial intelligence. Now today's ear, uh, uh, headphones, they're smaller, they're Bluetooth connected, they have AI, artificial intelligence. They can do a whole bunch of things. They're sleeker, they're lightweight. Uh, there's a whole bunch of functionalities. So see, that's not out of a science, fi uh, science fiction movie. We've been seeing uh, headphones exist for the past uh, few decades. But if you keep making something that you currently see or use around you and you want to make it better, lighter, faster, cheaper, more resistant to temperature changes, whatever, you have a chance of obtaining patent protection for that if it is new, if it works, if it is inventive. These are the laws, the patentability criteria in order to get a patent. So just start simple. Yes, you can go science fiction, go kind of way out there, but just start uh, by so trying to find a solution to a problem, make things better. And if I understand also like it, and then the same for the mouse, like when the mouse was created like uh, in the 1980s, it didn't look like this. Like it used to have a ball underneath that would roll. Now it's a red light. And now it has a little wheel on top. So you, you can go up and down the page with by just rolling the wheel. And, 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 then, and then you can have some mouse without a cable. So each of those new things could potentially be a separate invention. And you don't have to be, to be, and that separate invention doesn't have to be coming from the same person who invented the mouse to start with. It can come from anyone. So that's something to keep in mind. You can always look at ways to improve other inventions. So now that's my turn. Trademark is another type of intellectual property. So when you think of the name or logos of uh, companies or products, uh, so like McDonald's restaurant, the logo of McDonald's and the big M. Even they call their hamburger, instead of calling them hamburgers, all of them, they have different names. Big Mac, McChicken, uh, McCombo, Happy Meal, they're all trademarks. So if you go to Burger King, sometimes we slip up and ask for a Big Mac. Well, you should ask for a Whopper. Uh, and these are all, it's more than being catchy. Well, being catchy helps. I like it. Sometimes people ask, like, are you wearing those Nike or Reebok shoes because they are more comfortable or you, you are more, you perform better in your sport or is it only for looks? It could be for both. Uh, and so it can be very powerful to own, to be the one who create your own brand, your own logo, your own name. So it could be even just for clothing, huh? your t-shirt, you have a switch, the sweatshirt, and then you come up with your own logo or name and people, if it becomes popular, then that's when you can make money. And if someone tries to copy you, then with a trademark, that piece of paper, you can then try to block them. And if, and then they, if they, they, they still copy you, then there will be consequences because you have that paper and the same for a patent. Like a patent, you get that paper. If people want to copy you, they can rent your invention. And that's the way you make money. For trademark, you want to make sure you keep uh, others away. So if you're selling, like I was using the example uh, earlier today, uh, you go to the grocery store and you go to the cereal aisle. You want to buy cereal. Like I, I love cereal, I've tried so many. So once you, you find out that you like Fruit Loops or Honeycomb or, or Lucky Charms, the name is a trademark. The logo is a trademark. If it wasn't for trademark, like I know I love Fruit Loops. So as soon as I see it, I'm, I'm gonna go for it and I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna save some time so I may buy more. Because if there was no trademark, I would go in the grocery aisle and there would just be boxes with the list of ingredients. And it would take me half an hour to figure out which one is Fruit Loops again, like it, it, just by reading the list of ingredients. So, but because, but if someone else has a, a, a cereal brand that, that looks like Fruit Loops, and you can buy other cereal that looks like Fruit Loops, but they usually don't taste the same. But Fruit Loop, that company is the only one who could use that name Fruit Loops. 
The same with Coca-Cola. Uh, you can buy other cola that's not Coca-Cola, that could be a dollar cheaper, but there's still a lot of people who would pay that extra dollar or two because it's Coca-Cola, because they like Coca-Cola and they see the logo immediately, they go for it. So they save time. When you save time, you buy more. And it, it, just by seeing it, sometimes we buy it when we don't need it. So whoever is selling, if you, one day you're selling your own uh, products, by having a cool name, a logo, it can, it can play that same game. So you may sell more Coca-Cola just because they saw it on the way to work. Oh, I didn't know I, I, I was craving Coca-Cola and I saw Coca-Cola, I like it, you may buy more. You buy more, whoever's selling Coca-Cola is making more money. So that's the way you make money with it. And then you may, but because it's, it, you can make a lot of money with a trademark, make sure you don't copy. So if there's another company uh, selling hamburger, cheeseburger, maybe try not to call yourself McDonnell, even though it's not spelled exactly the same as McDonald's, because there are rules uh, to be fair, to be fair among companies who sell the same or similar goods. If it looks this, even, even, even if it's not spelled the same way, or if, even if it's not exactly the same words, if it looks the same when you look at it, if it sounds the same or similar when you, you, when you pronounce it out loud, or if it leaves the same impression when consumers see it, then there could be, that could be one of the rules that would, that would be a problem for you. There are a number of rules for trademark to make sure it's fair, and it's fair among competitors. Uh, we, uh, we don't want to say, oh, it's not fair, you're copying me, you're, you're taking all my clients you're trying to imitate me. So that's very important. That's one of the, the rules. And the example we gave on this slide is uh, South Pole selling popsicle or frozen dessert or frozen water products. And there's another company uh, that all was already that already existed that was selling ice cream and they were called North Pole. So if North Pole was there before and that was the name they picked for their ice cream, we would refuse South Pole. And not even if it's not exactly the same word, but yeah, it's something you have to keep in mind uh, when you come up with the name of your product or the name of your app or the name of your uh, clothing line or the name of your restaurant or your barbershop or you're a plumber, you're an electrician, it applies to everyone. So I have a question, Adre. So um, yeah. I think everybody here, we, we can keep a secret, right? So I know I said that I, you should not disclose uh, your invention if you don't, if you don't know how to do it, but I'm, we can keep a secret, okay? So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of developing my own type of uh, sports, uh, kind of a maybe a basketball shoe, like sports apparel, footwear, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I was thinking of using this. So Nick, because I'm, I'm Nicola, as you know, this is, would be my logo, and I would use Nick's because that's my name. So do you think this could work if I were to use that as my trademark? Uh, it, that's a good question. Uh, and I'm glad you're asking it. That may save you some pr problems uh, in the future. Well, it, it, I know your name is Nick, uh, uh, Nicola, or like, and maybe your nickname is Nick's, uh, Nick. Uh, but if it sounds like Nike's, and you're selling sports uh, goods uh, like Nike. Uh, then that, that could be a problem. So I would be careful. And then uh, you saw your logo looks like a more square check mark, but the, the logo of Nike is curved. And it's not because it's not exactly the same that you would not have problems with Nike. And like if I have a, another example is I'm selling a cola, like a, like a like soft drink, and my, lo my logo is a lion eating an apple. And if someone else comes with a tiger eating a pear, is that too close? It maybe it could it could be. So you have to be careful not to be too too close. Okay, so uh, copyright. That's my turn. So uh, copyright is about uh, and and you guys probably already use uh, copyrighted works in your day to day. So that's usually original creative works. That could be musical. It could be artistic. It could be you know, photography, it could be literature, it could be screenplays, so movies you watch, uh, songs you listen to. If, if you, you might already create your own creative works if you're into that 
artistic uh, uh, field. But what copyright gives you, it gives the creator of a work the right to decide what other people can do with it. So if you, you are writing music in your house or in the music class at school and you want to perhaps do something with it, maybe sell it, have it available on streaming platforms or give it give the right to other people to use your your songs in whatever work they do it could be advertising on tv or screenplays or soundtrack material for for movies basically that this is what copyright is all about you are giving the right to someone else to use your uh your original creative works most likely going to be an exchange of money if you want to make money out of that that's fair so this is what copyright gives you. Now you might already have seen the C with the circle around, which you see on the slide. This is the copyright symbol, right? So if you, if you have school textbooks around you, if you have uh, any sort of, of, of written material around you, you are most likely to find that symbol. This is not a mandatory symbol. You don't have to add it to your own creative works. It's a red flag. It's a way of indicating that someone else has created the work. It's no, you cannot use it for free or without their permission. It's kind of a red flag just to say, oh, this is copyrighted work. Mm, I should perhaps try to seek permission before I use it for my own benefit, right? So um, maybe some of you guys are in the software coding or you know, mobile app software coding. Uh, any sort of code that you create also is copyrightable because it's just as if you're writing uh, words on a sheet of paper, like you're writing a poem, you're writing a story, a short story, a novel, whatever. Uh, software code is also copyrightable because it's a language per se. Uh, the key to copyright is to be original. You don't want to copy others, right? So in intellectual property, you're going to see that the concept of originality, novelty, being unique, being distinctive, being original is a kind of a recurring theme you're going to hear across all of the different type of IP rights that we're talking about today. Certainly it applies for copyright. So as soon as someone copies someone else's, someone else's work, you might accuse them of not being original. They've just copied you, right? So if you're using YouTubes and TikToks to create your own little videos that you want to post online, or as soon as you create your own original video and you post it online, technically you have the copyright for that. Now, there are minor caveats to that, which we'll talk about in a few slides, but this is what copyright as a whole uh, encompasses. Well, I have a few questions, uh, Nicola. Um, so when I go on the internet and I search for images I wanna use uh, either on my website, when I created a website, I wanna use images, I, I search, and then I find images of uh, Mickey Mouse or uh, even uh, two, two cute cats or, well, going on the internet is free, and so those images are they're all I can all use them without a problem, or like how, how does that work? So if you so um, let's say you have a school presentation and you want to add a few pictures to your presentation to make it nicer, prettier, and you want to use pictures of cats or you know a sunset, something nice, uh, and you go on Google Images or any browser and you search their image database. Um, you don't have the right to use any image that you find for free. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean that it's free of rights. So if someone else took the picture of a sunset and you did not, the picture, uh, you're not the author and you're not the owner of the picture. So if you use that picture without asking for permission, you are somewhat infringing on that person's right. Quick example, Andre, is that if you leave your bike unattended, unlocked near the schoolyard or at work, and someone else grabs your bike and starts to run away with it and you start screaming, hey, that's my bike. Um, that's kind of the same way, right? They did not ask for permission to use your bike. Um, if they could have asked you permission, hey, Andre, can I use my bike? Can I, can I use your bike to go? I just need to run an errand quickly. You can say yes, but you can also say no. You could say yes for exchange of money. You might say, yeah, but you got to give me $5 for that. So copyright works the same way. So if you want to use images in your presentations at school or any sort of audio clips, uh, video clips, uh, photos, things like that. You need to get permission for that. Um, there's ways you can do that, which we won't talk about today because it can get complicated a bit, but there are ways to do that. But a quick, there are two quick, easy, uh, easy um, rules I can tell you right now. Use your own images, use your own works. So create your own artistic works or use images or clips that are free of rights. There are some on the internet. You can search and 
and filtered those through free of rights, that means that the author said, sure, I, 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 don't, I don't need money for that. You can use my picture for free. Just don't make money off of it. Use it for educational purposes. Use it for research purposes. That's fine. Um, so these are the kind of the golden rules I can, I can give you uh, on, on copyright today. And that, um, so, yeah, and, and, and then, like I said, the general rule is be, be, be careful. Uh, there are exceptions, like you mentioned, uh, there, there are a number of images or when you watch YouTube, you're allowed to watch YouTube. Uh, and so there, there, it doesn't mean there's no copyright, it just means they don't want to get paid for it. Uh, and then a lot of images could be that too, but just to be careful. And But what if I don't see the copyright symbol on, on the image? Uh, so does it mean there's no copyright if there's no copyright symbol? Uh, no, that doesn't mean that. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, using the copyright symbol is optional. It's not mandatory uh, according to the Copyright Act of Canada. However, it's a good practice to do that. It's a way of indicating that you are at least alleging, you are kind of claiming that you're the owner of the work that that you created so it's a way for others to say huh i can't use that work because someone else is uh, already has a, 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 an exclusive right to that right through a, a copyright uh, certificate that you can get with us at cpo in, in in canada now i do see a question in the chat i do want to take i, I want to address it right now i'll treat i'll try to be brief for ai created images so ai is a very hot topic as you know artificial intelligence so the current legislation in Canada, even in the US and other countries, is not fully aligned with how fast AI is progressing right now in terms of the output that it can create. It can it can create art, it can create music, it can create like text like you know, chat GPTs of the world, things like that. So for AI created images, as of now, the legislation still goes with a substantial amount of human involvement, right? So that means that a human being still needs to have a substantial uh, participation in the work that's created, right? So technically an AI created image does not constitute um, copyrighted material for the AI. So the AI has no right to the, to the image. There, it's, it's a very gray zone still. And what if a human being creates an AI that creates art? There's, that's another consideration. You may get a right to, if you create the AI that produces it, if you're just using a currently available AI product or a tool to create something for you. You don't, the AI doesn't own the work uh, and technically you don't do that. And you need to still have that human uh, involvement. That's as, as of now, it, it'll probably change as we move, as we move uh, in the future because it needs to change because AI is moving so fast. So I, I wanted to address the, the question. Uh, yeah, if I can add relevant. to, uh, yeah. if you're uh, any, anyone who's interested in um, uh, artificial intelligence, chat GPT and uh, intellectual property, our, our most recent podcast on our website, uh, we are interviewing a lawyer in Montreal on, the, on some of the questions that they are asking themselves. And so that like Nicola touches upon one as to, the author needs to be a human, but there, so there are nuances, how much human involvement. In some cases, there could be enough human involvement. And also another issue is we heard Nicola saying that you're, we can't copy others. And that's a problem that uh, chat GTP or artificial intelligence, they go on the internet, they take a bunch of information that's out there and they make something new. But they could be copying. So th those are those uh, software, artificial intelligence software, and ChatGTP, for example, or Bing, the new Bing that's trying to do the same. If they, let's say you can ask them to do a, a picture, but they do they could they could be copying that 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 software could be copying someone else's picture or or too much of it, and that could be copying. So. So there are a lot of good questions there, and then uh, some of the questions are are tentatively answered by the podcast because even the podcast uh, lawyer says it's so new that these questions are a bit can be can, are still to be uh, uh, tested uh, with with judges around the world. 
Oh, another question. I noticed a lot of trending AI video games follow the exact same format with small differences. So that is interesting. Yeah, and I'll, I'll let Nicola also add uh, if he wants to, but one little thing, uh, if, if a video game or I'll use an example that went to the, all the way to the top court uh, of our country, uh, uh, not in the school principal's office, but in the Supreme Court of Canada in front of nine judges. And it was uh, Monsieur Claude Robinson in Quebec uh, was trying to sell this cartoon idea to a big company. And, and, and it was a Robinson Crusoe or something like that. And it was a cool cartoon concept with characters and a script. And like, it was pretty detailed. And, they, and then the company said, no, oh, we're not interested. But then the company turned around and came up with a cartoon that was pretty close. Not just the concept or the idea, because you can't protect an idea, huh? like copyright. You can't say, oh, I want to I, I wanna be the only one who can write a book about a boy being raised in the jungle by animals. It, that's too broad, because we know there are two stories that is that concept. One is Jungle Book, and the other one is uh, Tarzan. But if you go into more detail, like Mr. Claude, Claude uh, from Quebec, he had more detail to the story. It was not exactly, the whole script wasn't written, but it was so much detail that he was able to win in court. He was able to say, they copied me. They copied me too much. You owe me a lot of money. So that's an example. The same with video games. So I would be careful if, if someone develops a, a video game, you have to be sure you don't, uh, that Mickey Mouse and then Pluto and it's not walking around in your cartoon without uh, Walt Disney uh, or Disney Disney as permission. And, 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 and yeah, a lot of questions that are could be interesting. If, Nicola, if you have something to add, otherwise I'll just go to industrial design. Yeah, let, let, let's proceed, I think. And then we'll take, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the questions after also just to make sure we don't miss any questions. But uh, industrial design very quickly. So it's not the function or how an object works, but it, how it looks. Uh, so uh, the shape of the, let's say the new car, the new uh, uh, Volkswagen Jetta that, that uh, in 2024, the new model, oh, look at the curves on the car. So that would be an industrial design or the shape of a new designer table or a new designer lamp or the shape of a shoe or even patterns, patterns like under the shoe. If you, if you take your Reebok, you look under and then there's a cool pattern underneath. If it's unique, if it doesn't exist in the world, you can protect with industrial design the way it looks. And, and then the same for uh, the shape, like the shape of object, or just like the configuration, or the way images are are laid out on a, either on the chair. We see the chair image, the way the, the the design of the chair. If that design of where the little squares are, you see the little square, different color, they they overlap. If it's if that's a new pattern, uh, then you, or ornament or configuration and you're selling a lot of those chairs, it, it, it may be a good idea to try to get an industrial design. If you're only selling two chairs or five chairs to family members, maybe you may not pay money to try to get industrial design, but if you're selling uh, hundreds of thousands of them or enough, then it, it, it may make sense to, to, to have that piece of paper that would allow you to block others from copying you. And if they want to copy you, and, and, and make that chair, then they would need to rent. They would need to borrow essentially your, your industrial design, but they would need to pay you money to borrow. And then you can have more than one person borrowing. That's the beauty of the, in the bike, the bicycle example, there's only one person who can take the bike and borrow it from you. But when you have a patent, a trademark, a copyright, industrial design, a lot of people can borrow. And that's the beauty. So if I do a, a Taylor Swift or a Justin Bieber, like I, and multiple people could be listening at the same song at the exact same time all around the world. And so if it's on radio, you can listen to for free, but the radio station, they pay money to be able to play Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, or even if they, even if they wanted to play my 
my piano composition. I compose piano. They're on the, and the first 23 are on my album for friends and family. It's up to me if I want to decide if I want to make money or not. But it, 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 I still own the copyright. And I could, if the radio wanted to play, or if I heard my music in a famous Canadian movie, they better ask me permission. Otherwise, I, I would, they, they could be in trouble. So I see a hand uh, raised by Jeff. Oh, okay, yeah. Jeff, did you want to take the mic and ask a question, or is it about the question you were asking in the chat? If you want to speak up, or we can we can do this offline after today's meeting if you prefer. Just let us know. Either way. So uh, while while we get back to you, I'll, I'll just proceed. Uh, I believe we have a, up a, until a quarter after. So uh, basically, the goal of this. Oh, no problem. Accident. No problem. So basically. Um, so Andre and I have explained to you the four types of IP rights to which you can actually get an exclusive legal right in Canada, and you can actually seek equivalents in other countries, the US, in big markets where you want to basically uh, sell and get yourself known with your company, your brand, your product offering. But IP is all around you, even at your age, what you're doing in life right now, uh, you're going to school, most likely, um, IP is all around you. So you start your day, you're gonna wake up with an alarm clock. So there's probably a patent that, or many patents into your alarm clock. Maybe it's a watch, maybe it's a phone that you're using to wake you up. Uh, maybe it has a brand, maybe it has a specific shape. So it could have an industrial design and a trademark. Uh, you get your, you, you wear clothes. So articles of clothing may have visible brands, names and logos. So again, you're, show, you're showing to the world that you're, there are brands that you like and you're purchasing the good for that and it has a trademark on that. So that's very visible. So you're, you're basically uh, being very visible about the intellectual property that belongs to someone else. If you're eating a bowl of cereal, I know what Andre talked about several brands of very popular cereal. So why are you eating those cereals? Is it because you like the taste because it's cheaper, they're cheaper than others, or is it simply because you're attracted to the brand and the trademark that's attached to it? and you've always used that particular uh, brand of cereal because you like it, so you keep going back to it. So that's the power of, of branding, which can also be tied to a trademark. And if you're using appliances to heat up your, your breakfast, to toast your bread, uh, warm up, you know, refrigerator, there's most likely going to be patents attached to that as well. So you see IPs all around you, even as soon as early as, you know, 6, 7 a.m. when you're starting your day. Um, and then you're going to school, so same deal. You're probably wearing a pair of sneakers that you really like, a pair of boots. So why are you going with those sneakers or boots? Is it because your parents are telling you to, to, to go with them because they're warmer and they paid for them? Or is it because you really like the, the, the brand, the logo, the look they have? So again, you're probably going to be attracted to uh, intellectual property that belongs to someone else. And you're probably going to listen to music and play games on your phone or your tablet as you go to school, in the bus or walking. Again, you are consuming, you are uh, using uh, intellectual property that belongs to someone else. So it's all around you, as you can see. And even during the pandemic, unfortunately, most of us had to go through remote learning. So using Teams and Zooms and uh, WebEx and uh, another one, I forget the name, but uh, using basically mobile applications or software applications to attend school and have virtual school with your teachers. So again, there's most likely going to be a lot of IP that's attached to such, uh, you know, uh, software and application, mobile applications. So yeah, and even at school, you could be creating uh, in science class, uh, or like a Jeff's question, uh, if you're at the science fair, uh, like a, like a, either a regional or the national uh, competition. It's very important. So we're going to try to address uh, Jeff's question uh, here, uh, and we often we often have those discussions uh, at our at work. Uh, even when you, we read, we we read that students across the country they sometimes it's in the media that they come up with a pretty cool invention. So you have to be careful. So the first thing is the, that's the tricky part. That's the complicated part in Jeff's question. There's no easy answer. Uh, in Canada, we're not the only one who, who, who and then we're, at, we're and then that, that are asking those questions and, and then and then it's probably been asked for, for, for generations. 
because you have to keep it secret. So let's say your invention is would meet the three criteria. Let's say it did. Let's say you uh, you you ask a professor, someone who's an expert in getting the answer to whether are you the first in the world? Is it uh, useful? Does it work? And is it innovative? Is uh, is it ingenious? Uh, if it does, the rule, the general rule, and there are many exceptions, there are exceptions, there are ways, there are solutions sometimes as well. So it's not black or white. There's sometimes there's some gray. And then we, when we say gray is that there's no clear yes or no answer. But so if it is potential, a potential patent, the, the rule is you have to be the first to file, not the first to think about it. So if you do talk about it, during a presentation in class, or at the science fair, or when you're an adult, you're trying to get money to to move, to, to go to, to you have to borrow money from them, and you're trying to tell them about your idea. So there, you have to be careful as to what you say. So that's the general rule, and that's assuming that you're really the first in the world. It may be that you're you're not the first in the world, or it, it could be also that. Uh, th that it could also be that that your your plan is not to get a patent. So that it, it, that gets into a complicated, uh, I guess, answer in, in a sense because that's the first thing if it is uh, potentially patentable. So not everything at a, in science class or in science fair may get to that point, but that's where uh, there, there there was. Um, that so, so sometimes we hear uh, we hear stories that they would have approached with their parents, for example, if their kids uh, a, a, an expert in, in patent, it, just to see if. And then you can also, like uh, like Nicola said, adults can help do searches and, and including with the kids. Uh, and then you can do their not only Google, you can search Google patent. It's actually a website that we recommend to use to, to search. But you try to look, and then but you can also look at the the, the different patent uh, search sites. We have one on our website, and that, that, that's where you can search all the patents that were filed in Canada that are now uh, uh, not secret. And, and then you can search other countries so the, to see who filed for patents in the United States or other countries to see, and that may help you uh, with your science project to see. Okay, is there some? Okay, I thought of a machine. Uh, that is going to capture uh, the sunlight to make energy. And, and so you're going to look at, okay, well, I can use Google and to search what's out there to help me to try to figure out how I can come up with something even better for my science project. And you never know, you could find things there that would be a, a lot more powerful than just using Google. And so you have to, if you apply for a patent, you have to, uh, eventually you would have to say who are the inventors. So if you did this with a friend or with people, then they would all need to be listed. And then you have to write, you don't send your invention to, to the government of Canada. You don't send it to our office. What you do send is the drawings, detailed drawings, the detailed description. So you describe in words how it works and what problem you're trying to solve. So it, it's very detailed. It's a bit like the instructions of when you get, uh, you buy furniture at the furniture store and it comes in pieces in a box and then you open the box and there's a piece of paper and it tells you uh, there's a 42 steps to put the, the pieces together. It's a bit like that. If you're in, so when, when we get the document, the expert in the government of Canada would look at the, your description and would look at your drawings and they would be able to, to see if it works based on that. Okay. so. If you do have to tell people, normally the general rule, again, that's where it gets complicated. So if it, it, when and they need to, to talk to people before they file, then they wouldn't usually have the other person uh, on a piece of paper. It's, it's called a, a contract a, a, to make sure that they keep it confidential. So there are ways to do that as you progress in your innovation. Uh, and and your journey as 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 you're you're getting, and um, so if you do like we already talked about the last points on the slide. So if you make presentations, make sure you use your images or that you're not uh, using other people's image. But again, there are exceptions when it's for general exceptions for when it's education. 
but even for those exceptions, there are a lot of rules. So don't, don't always assume uh, even adults that are teacher in the room, um, it can be more tricky than, than you think. So when you do your own PowerPoint slides, and uh, even when you do photocopies at the library, uh, the reason you can do it usually is because the library obtained the permission and is paying a fee, a bit like the radio station that plays music. You can listen for free, but you don't know that they actually paid to put the, the music on the radio. And I'm yes. going to go over time, I think. Is, it, or is that that 115 or? Yeah, let us know if we can keep, uh keep uh, talking. Alicia. Yeah, we are officially out of time uh, okay. because some of the areas the school ends. Um, yep. So I would like to thank you both. But for those who would like to stay, maybe we can continue. Um, but uh, if people would like to leave, it's fine too. I know in some areas the school's uh, closing time. Perfect. And then you'll see my contact information. Uh, the slides can be distributed. Like I sent a copy to the Brilliant Labs. And then you'll see my email address because I'm the one for Connected Canada, but the uh, www.canada.ca backslash IP dash advisors, you'll see all of our emails, including Kala's email, our nice pictures that are copyrighted, but uh, also <laughs> a, a little story about us. So if you want to learn, learn more about us, you'll see that uh, at, at the cool uh, canada.ca website. Well, thank you so much. Uh, this is very informative and I had the privilege to attend both the sessions. Um, and it's pretty fascinating. Some of the things that you mentioned, it's like we come across with this day to day and yet, it, you know, we can think about it, pause and it's like every, it's not just when you're inventing something, you need to think about it. Um, people, the students especially, can start thinking about right now, protecting their own work. Um, so thank you so much for informing us, for enlightening us, uh, and giving such awesome presentation. As I mentioned, that I would close the recording now, but if people would like to stay, if you both are okay for some uh, post-talk questions, uh, we can stay here for uh, a few more minutes. Yep, I'm available. I have nothing.